Hello, this lecture is on assessment design and deals with first principles, essentially the purpose and principles of assessment. And you should approach this lecture as very much a revision or overview of the concept to prepare you for assessment design practice, uh, which is the topic that follows. So we'll follow the familiar structure of placing the lecture in context, of reviewing some key terminology and ideas, and then ending with some practical things for you to do next. This lecture contributes towards two of the objectives of this topic, namely to examine the concepts of complex learning, validity and reliability, and to discuss the arguments for and against the assessment of deep and surface learning. Not all of these terms appear in the lecture, and it's about linking this lecture to the reading and back to these ideas of complex learning, validity, reliability, deep and surface learning. So we know from our own individual practice that assessment can influence what, where and how students study because they're often very assessment focused. Assessment can undoubtedly shape students' beliefs about what's valued in a course of study. As a consequence, we should try and step back from the assumptions that we make about assessment. So let's consider for a moment why we assess. It could be because we seek to guide and motivate the student towards parts of their learning that we want them to focus on in the future. It might be because we want to give them opportunities to practice or evidence the learning outcomes of their course. It may be in order to generate feedback on student learning to support the first two of these points. So whether it's motivation, learning opportunities or feedback, these are all things that feed forward to the student but it may also be to generate a mark, a grade, to benchmark a student against the criteria for study. It might be a mechanism to check the quality of teaching and learning on a given course to make sure that students are learning what the course has proposed to teach, so it could be a QA mechanism. Very often we just don't distinguish between these reasons, but we should, because understanding why we assess helps us to be more creative and relevant in the design of our assessments. Here are five principles of assessment. So assessment should be constructively aligned. We've talked a lot about Biggs's notion of constructive alignment. It should be directly aligned to the stated learning outcomes and supported by, by aligned teaching and learning activities. This applies as much to formative ongoing assessment throughout a program as it does to any summative assessment. Assessment should be reliable, so this concept of reliability is extremely important. It should be possible for two people looking at the same piece of assessment to arrive at the same or very similar judgment based on some explicit criteria. Assessment should be valid. It should assess what it purports to assess. So, for example, a complex higher order thinking skill is not likely to be assessed in something that constitutes a memory exercise, for example, or a very practical skill is not very likely to be tested in a pure written format, and so on. There's also the notion that assessment should be fair. It should be possible for all students to have an equal opportunity to succeed in any given assessment. And whilst there are obviously opportunities to make reasonable adjustments, the notion of fairness still holds true. Assessment should also be relevant, so it should be possible for a student to apply the learning derived from the assessment in the real world and in their future learning. So here are five principles that I think it's very important to carry forward into your own design process. It should be constructively aligned, it should be reliable, valid, fair and relevant. We might also ask, when is the best time to assess? Where we've emphasised the interconnectedness of the learning process, of the student's awareness of their own progress and the self-management of learning, these two terms, which are used very, very widely in the literature, are perhaps a little bit blurred around the edges and we need to think a little bit about how we use them in our practice and whether we can't be a little bit more sophisticated in our use of language. Knowing why we assess can help us design when to assess. So if an assessment is designed to motivate and to practice learning opportunities, it may need to be continuous and supportive. It may be formative and run through the entire module or the entire course. 
if the assessment is designed to be for feedback, it might be possible to do this from the very beginning of the course through some self or peer feedback as well as tutor feed forward approaches. If the assessment is to grade the student, then this may come in stages or at the end of a period of study where only when the student's equipped to provide the evidence that the assessment's designed to show. So the distinction between formative and summative is perhaps not as clear as it might at first appear. It's more a question of when. Think of it as ongoing assessment for the purpose of developing a student's awareness of their own learning versus a form of assessment which provides students with the opportunity to, to demonstrate or provide evidence that they have learnt to a particular level or a particular stage within a period of study. So formative and summative themselves are perhaps used a bit casually, uh, not so much in the literature but in our practice on an everyday basis. And thinking about when we're assessing as much as how and why we're assessing are extremely important. So it might seem obvious but knowing why and when allows the assessment designer to manage expectations, to manage student motivations and to manage progress in some very significant ways. In addition to the notion of formative assessment or assessment for learning as we've described it and summative assessment, I think there are some other concepts in assessment that are worth mentioning. You'll come across them in the literature. They're ideas which perhaps you want to explore in your own practice. So let's look at a few. Diagnostic assessment. Diagnostic assessment's intended, a bit like formative assessment, to help students to learn, to support their learning but it's usually used to look backwards as to what the student might already know, perhaps to uncover or correct a misconception. Dynamic assessment is a term that's used to describe the specific learning capabilities of students to perhaps assess learning styles or preference to learning. Synoptic assessment is a term used to describe the process of encouraging students to draw on a broad range of learning from across their current programme of study or perhaps to include previous study in order to better contextualise their learning to more, more broadly than simply using the currently defined learning outcomes and associated assessment. Programme-wide awareness of assessment can be a very strong motivator for students. Ipsative assessment is effectively self-referenced assessment. How well am I doing as an individual relative to my own previous performance rather than with reference to others or to some external criteria? Which brings us to the final very important concept, the notion of criterion referenced assessment. The idea that criterion referenced assessment allows every student's work, each individual student's piece of work, to be measured against some predetermined standard. This is usually a marking rubric or perhaps an exemplar assignment, usually in the form of some kind of rubric. And students are graded against that criteria and not against each other. So as a consequence it's possible for all students on a course to get very high marks or for all students to get very low marks depending on their positions relative to some external criteria rather than to each other. Now in theory it's possible for all students to get 100% but if it's the intention of the assessment to d demonstrate some degree of differentiation in a cohort then the marking rubric can be fine-tuned to ensure that there is some sort of distribution of marks. But the idea that one has a, a bell curve and that marks are distributed across it uh, is, is a somewhat outdated notion. A rubric would probably demonstrate that if it allows for a, a sufficient degree of differentiation but the idea is that there are externally referenced criteria which the students are aware of. So these concepts, diagnostic, dynamic, formative, summative, synoptic, ipsative and criterion referenced are all things that you should be aware of as you look forward to forms of assessment, the different kinds of things that you might do uh, to assess your students uh, in your own practice. So some of the practical things uh, that you can do looking forward First, do take some time after this lecture to think about how your current assessment for learning or formative learning supports students in the ipsative and synoptic assessment forms. So how is a student being helped to reference their own learning, to see how they're making their own progress? What do you do to support students to track their own progress? What do you do to have them link the current learning to other forms of learning? What synoptic assessment opportunities are there? Are they encouraged to relate current learning in, in this module to previous modules? How are they being encouraged to measure self-progression? Thank you for your attention. I hope you found the lecture interesting.